Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we talk to founders and builders designing the next version of the world. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I'm founder of a, uh, something called Write to Know You. I like to write. I like to read, think, and process to understand what the heck is going on in the world. A lot coming at us. With me, as always, is Mark Fielding, talented writer, lore developer, uh, subject matter expert in Web3 for hire, this guy is. Uh, we're thankful to have him on the show. Mark, I would love you to tell these guys about the book club. <laughs> I can't believe you've dragged me off Farcaster to speak about the book club. Now, um, should I be hosting an emerging tech po podcast when my favorite tech is books? Um, so <laughs> Yes, absolutely. It's the original tech. Words, the, and, words the original and letters. Tech. The so original think, tech. Thinking on Paper has a book club every week. Me and Jeremy and the community explore the chapter of a book in detail um why why do we do this book clubs um the, they help you connect the dots more deeply don't they you think in new ways when you're bouncing ideas and perspectives off other people the um, strategies and insight that you might miss all kind of percolates to the surface so we do it because it helps us understand the books better so thinking on paper xyz to to learn more about the book club but today's show, the this is your one, Jeremy. You're excited about this one. We've done a few shows on emerging technology and music. We had um, In The Full, Music In The Metaverse, still our most watched YouTube video. We had uh, Jesper Nordin, the personalization of in-game music. And we had this Joe, is we, the final one. Well, we had Joe Belliotti too, the oh, former of head of music of Coca-Cola. So on the brand yeah. side, he had, and that's a great episode if you brand folks are trying to figure out how to integrate with music. Joe knows his stuff. Uh, you can find the podcast uh, everywhere you listen to him and even on YouTube, right? Um, so yeah, today is exciting. Um, we wanted, and it definitely aligns with, with our wonderful sponsor, Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. So what these guys do is they have 3,000 plus vetted solopreneurs, experts of their craft uh, at your disposal. So they do a great job of like building and stacking these teams of interdisciplinary experts to point to whatever project or program you have going on. So check those guys out. They're wonderful. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So um, our guest today is Toa Dunn. He spent a decade, I believe nearly a decade, maybe in and around, basically defining what music means to a major gaming company, Riot Games. Um, through the lens of music, he actually extended in-game IP into the realm of music and kind of blurring the lines between that experience. And guess what's happening right now in the market? Like the lines between music and gaming are, are really blurring, right? Because musicians are trying to figure out what next level experiences could look like, access to gaming engines and being able to build something in Fortnite, in Fortnite development tools. Like there's all kinds of access to that stuff now. On the flip side, you have gamers that are like, you know, not everyone can should be building a game because games are games and they're difficult to manage and build and make meaningful and impactful. So anyway, they're almost inseparable, really, aren't they? Now, music and gaming, gaming and music, it, they're becoming, yeah, connected so deeply. And the, the, it's, now you can't remove that link. It's absolutely so what so what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a couple things. We're going to talk about what it takes to build and inspire teams it in kind of the murky waters of interdisciplinary innovation i know that was a lot that i threw out there but i, I want to think about that and it ties into the nexus from our book club we did a whole book eight episodes on on how music or how art technology and science kind of come together and are orchestrated to build new and great things we'll also talk about the future of music and all of that so I'm tired of talking. You're tired yeah. of probably listening to me Come talk. On, let's bring in. On. Let's bring in our our guest Toa. Welcome to the show. So glad you're here. How are you this morning? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Really excited about this. This is like I said. This is one of the topics that I love diving into. I'm super passionate about it. So looking forward to this. Awesome. Well, let's hey, let's ju jump right in the waters. And I want to I want to bring a little bit of kind of the, some of the stuff you've done in the past to kind of level set where we're going and and people can kind of get their heads around some of the teams you had to build so to start like what does a music strategy look like for a gaming company yeah so it can really depend right so uh depending on the studio and the games the types of products and types of games right so um, there's many different genres of games 
and how music really works with those games can be very different, um, right? So, for example, for for many very competitive games, you know, kind of like League of Legends, um, it's really I can kind of compare it to like a sport itself. Like if you're into NBA and watch basketball, but music's role in a highly competitive game may be more for the background, and often, you know, sometimes it can kind of disturb the experience of gameplay. So, for example many competitive players, they really need to be keen on what's going on in the game, right? They're kind of listening to anything that gives them, you know, kind of what's going on in the game, um, where the com where the competitors are, they need to be really in tune for the game. So the music itself can get in the way of that. So often, they may even need to mute it, they don't want it so upfront, right? So if you ever go to an NBA game, for example, a, a live NBA game, you know, they play the music in between gameplay, but once the gameplay starts, the players need to be able to hear everything that's going on, the calls that they have going between each other. And so the music can play further back. Now, obviously, if you get into other genres of games, you know, like um, more narrative driven, um, maybe music can have more of a upfront kind of role in that experience. And so the music strategy can be quite different. Um, it just really depends on the game and your kind of overall goals. Um, while I was at Riot, um, we kind of the strategy really, we started off kind of trying to figure out what music's role could be. And at that time, which was just League of Legends, and then became esports, and then film and TV later on with Arcane, and then of course our other games like Valorant, TFT. And so the music strategy really was there as I approached it from the lens of what could music really add to the experience? Where can we really inject music to amplify the experience, enhance the experience for players? Um, can we deepen and foster that connection, whether to the IP or to the game itself? So there's almost not a single strategy often. Um, at least that's that's kind of been my approach. Um, but it's more of just like figuring out what mechanics of music you can really pull to help enhance the overall player experience, if that makes sense. 100 percent makes sense and and quick shouts to uh to the, to the great nolan ether joining us he's got us paired so hello to nolan's audience uh, out there today um nolan's digging your setup there toa um <laughs> one of one of the interesting things so here's uh, for those of you that listen to the show I've, you know most of you know i'm kind of a lacrosse nerd i still play i coach high school teams and club teams and very involved in lacrosse we had brendan coleman from the premier lacrosse league on the show and they use music indoor lacrosse uses music in a very interesting way right you talk about like an nba music's in between in mm -hmm. in indoor lacrosse music is used during the game like while it's happening so when your team the home team has the has the ball on offense it's you hear like you know danger zone like kenny loggins right but when <laughs> when they're when the opposing team is on offense you'll hear like the carpenters or something so it's this very like they use music in a, in a cool way but like toa you mentioned something it again Joe Belliotti, who's a guest on the show, hinted at that he always said, you know, what music can do for that situation and what that situation can do for music. And how do you how did you use that to to bring on partners in the right way uh, that were aligned with what was important for gaming? Yeah, right. So this gets into that space of, you know, authenticity is the word that's often used of how well you can integrate music and partners um, into gaming. So for us, it was really a growing kind of a growing and understanding um, on the way. So some of our earlier projects was trying to figure that out. So, I, I, you know, some of my first projects, this had to have been 2013 or so with League, is, you know, releasing new characters was our bread and butter. Um, and so we were looking for ways of how music can really enhance, you know, just that experience. We have these new characters. And instead of leaning into, you know, you have this new character and you have this more kind of background soundtrack to some visual element to kind of like show who the character is we wanted to push this a little bit more um and so you know, we'd had this character his name was uh lucian and he was kind of this like neo from the matrix futuristic gunner very slick and fast um adc and so we kept thinking about music that was you know very high tempo and you know, like electronic music and we kept referencing um the crystal method in fact and so for us, that was kind of the the connection. And so we had reached out to the Crystal Method and ended up producing a song um, to help launch and release this new character, Lucian. And so I think it's really about, it's a few things. It's one, it's the overall like strategy of how music fits in, but you also want to hit that kind of authenticity, 
right? Like you want the creative synergy to match of the partner you're working with, as well as the product that it is or um, whatever it's supposed to be a part of. Because it's it can be easy to just say, hey, there's a there's a partner we want to work with and just slap that on anything. Um, but it it doesn't quite fit well, right? So that becomes kind of the art of trying to figure out how to find the right partners for the right products or experiences um, at that time. If that makes sense. Is that ever, is there ever a conflict of interest between the audience playing the game and the game itself, whereby the game might lend itself to this particular style of music, but the audience who are playing the game would run a mile from that particular kind of music? Oh, def definitely, right? That, that's probably always a risk. Um, the thing I used to, I mean, I can laugh at it now, right? <laughs> but the thing I used to be nervous about all the time is, you know, you never know if the audience, the players are actually going to like what you're about to deliver. Like you don't know until they get it in their hands and they play with it a little bit and then they'll give you feedback. Right. So that that to me was always the scariest moment where you've spent nine months to a year working on something, you know, your whole team, blood, sweat and tears. And then you're like, I hope they like this thing because <laughs> we're about to put it out there um so that that's when you end up spending the most time on youtube watching all the feedback and reaction videos and really trying to get a sense so you know it obviously helps to be really in touch with the game and the player base um you know a lot of us played league a lot and so that helped us of having kind of that guiding star of kind of you know both from a craft perspective and a curation perspective um so yeah, you, 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 it can, you hope it doesn't, you know, you don't have that effect where you put something out there and it's like, that's not what we want. But of course that could always happen. Like that's the risk, right? Just and especially if you're trying, oh, go ahead. No, no, sorry. I thought you, sorry, my apologies for interrupting just before we move on. Um, are these original pieces that the musicians are making or are these generally you're using former tracks or is it a mix? Yeah, it's a mix. It can really depend on a few things, right? One, your budget. Um, and two, you know, there's, if you have, you know, you could have, we have an internal team of compos composers, right? And producers. Um, but you can also work with other highly talented composers that aren't part of the company, right? And then you can also work with, you know, more, you know, musicians, singer songwriters, and things like that, maybe that are more well known as well. So all of that comes into, being a part of your decision matrix of, well, what are we trying to create here? Does this need to be something absolutely bespoke, right? Um, you know, if you're, if you have this, uh, you know, maybe it's a trailer, but it's, it's not, it, you know, you're building this trailer and it's really trying to deliver on a heavy narrative, right? So the pacing is really on emotion and story. Um, you may need a composer to really just kind of compose, you know, against that, right? Because it's not just going to be a song playing, right? It needs to hit the emotional parts at the parts that you need and deliver that kind of story and emotion arc um, versus maybe you just need something that's really hype and exciting, right? It's just kind of like a reel of action. And maybe you can work with a cool artist that has great songs and you can just kind of, you know, build a visual alongside that so it is a mix and part of that part of that is what you need to try to figure out is like what's going to make sense for this yeah ab absolutely um quick shouts from uh to italy pier paolo good to see you out here thanks Buongiorno. for listening yeah what's happening man we're global top is global um so all right we're talking about music from the outside in to gaming let's talk about music or let's talk about gaming from inside the game projecting outside to music right so let me let me clarify that a little bit so you've taken ip within a game and basically created artists that make and release music that were essentially characters or skins or whatever in a game what was it like to to do that and and how did you figure out how to select the right one to start with <laughs> um yeah great question Right. So there's um, <clears throat> a pretty heavy kind of creative and strategic process in that. Right. So we had created, you know, our first actually our first band really was Pentakill, which is a heavy metal band um, and Pentakill, the characters themselves. Right. So we have characters within League of Legends. Right. We have this great IP. They had this great IP and all these characters and we call them, you know, right, calls them champions. Um, and then 
creating these kind of costumes or alternate universes or versions of them is kind of the bread and butter uh, for League of Legends, you know, kind of new ways to kind of experience and play as those characters. So Pentakill had already existed in the game um, when I came on board. Um, there wasn't any true music activation on it, um, but we had seen like some players around the world that would cosplay as them and act as if they were like this band that did play music, right? So they were really just kind of pushing the lore forward of like, all right, cool, they exist in game. What if we kind of acted like them? And so we took that of interest because a few, of, you know, a few of our like composers and teammates really were into metal, of course, and a lot of us love metal. And so we, we kind of asked ourselves, what if they did, what if they really were a band? What would that be like? And so, you know, it was like, oh, they'd have this album. So we, you know, it was a passion project of the team kind of on the weekends of, you know, recording, writing and recording, acting as if this group Pentakill was a band. And then we released their music as if they were a band. So it wasn't this, hey, League of Legends or Riot Games has done this metal album. We, we kind of looked at gorillas to an extent. So we, we created a website. I think it was like pentakillmusic.com or something like that. And we put their first single on there. Um, and then with an, you know, kind of a callback that in the next week or two, the full album was going to drop. So we just kind of treated them like a, a real, like a real band. And that was kind of an experiment with us. It, it resonated really well with our players. And then, you know, we ended up doing Pentakill three times. And then, um, when we got into KDA, which was 2018, it was, this is when we actually had to create the band, right? So KDA did not exist. There were many characters to select from. So we went through this kind of creative and strategic process of one, figuring out, all right, who are the roles of this, you know, of this band? What are the roles and kind of the tropes that we think are exciting? Um, like who's the lead singer? And then from there, you have to kind of look at this roster of characters from League of Legends and then try to figure out, well, who would make a good lead singer, right, of this group? And so from there, you kind of picked and built this band, right? And at the same time, you're building out their personality and the things we we thought about were, you know, since these characters already existed, people had a connection to these characters in League of Legends. So you didn't want to just take a character and totally transform them in a way where people almost wouldn't recognize or even believe that like that's that character, right? So you have these kind of core truths to the character, like their personality, who they are, and you kind of adjusted them slightly you made them a more there was like a more modern take to them but they were still that character right um uh, thanks for sharing that leak as well pentakill uh, great music you should check it out but um right so, so it was really i'm a big metal fan i'm looking forward to it <laughs> yeah i'll send you some more links um it's it's great music and i actually for my workouts and everything the, the first album especially is still on my rotation um but yeah so that became the creative process is really trying to figure out who are the right characters? What are their stories? How and how do they work together? And then, cool, let's create some music that really fits for this band that comes from this band. And so, um, it, it's really interesting to kind of go through that process of like building a band. It's like for me, it was like, how do we build the ultimate band, right? Because um, we're really doing this for players, um, and then getting into the you know music production, creative. What is the story behind them? Um, and everything. So that was an incredible process. And it was definitely new at the time when we were doing it. Um, and so we learned, learned an incredible lot as far as like what it takes to, to do something like that. Amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm definitely going to jump into that, uh, workout rotation today and see if I see, see what I'm a metal guy too. Um, you ever, have you ever played on any, any virtual bands, Jeremy? Have I played as a, as the musician in a virtual band? Yeah. No. I haven't like as a character in a game or anything. No, I haven't yet <laughs> on, on your list. Put it on your list. It's on my list for sure. Yeah. That and making, uh, making the soundtrack or making the sound of the next, uh, innovation of a car. Right. <laughs> you know, Hans Zimmer, Hans Zimmer's already jumped on that, but, uh, maybe I can, maybe I can get like the K cars or like, you know, some kind of used Datsun that goes no, electric. You, you, yeah. look, you look like a young James Hetfield. You gotta go for the, yeah. the virtual metal band. Dig it. Dig it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so let's all right. So we talked about a couple of examples, Toa. Let's let's get some more of the framework of of teams, right? So mm -hmm. there are th there are two teams. The way I see it, just in my mind, and feel free to riff on this, but like there 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 
there are teams internal to like a company's core business, right? So if we stay in the realm of Riot Games, you know, it's the it's the game development team, right? As you know, just to be very general with it. And then you have teams that are adjacent to the core business to basically push the boundaries a little bit and like explore um, new adjacencies that could potentially turn into, you know, additives to that core business. So what are some of the key uh, things to consider in building the team that kind of lives in the adjacent possible, so to speak, and, and what qualities of people do you look for and how do you connect and inspire those people? Yeah, like <clears throat> this is, um, it's a great question, right? So there's, there's this kind of progress to that, right? So starting off, you know, music, <laughs> At Riot in the, in the early days was really part of right. So games being the the core product and everything's built into that. You know, music was there to support the game. Um, and in the very first and early days, um, through time, after doing some great you know activations, you know, characters that are being released. So we're we're creating music to help support and launch new characters. We're doing music videos, um, and our ambitions kind of really grew because. You know, we were hearing from our players how much they loved our music, right? It, it, it started to become core to the brand to an extent. There was a, a funny joke in, in certain parts of, um, especially in Asia, certain parts of the world, where they would make this joke of Riot Games is a is a music company that happened to make a great game, <laughs> um, right? And so that's when we, that's we, when we were getting that kind of feedback, we're like, all right, maybe we should put more into this, right? So there was this starting off as like a support team of the core product. And then we started trying some things and had this dream and ambition like, well, what if we were another pillar within Riot Games, right? And this kind of gets into things of like early thinking about, you know, Riot Entertainment to an extent, right? Like, hey, the, what if we were more than games? And, you know, music was really starting to prove that it could connect to players. And this is at the same time that we had, you know, esports really, we were starting to really invest in esports. So with, with the game being the core product, and then you had music and you had kind of esports at that time. Um, we started trying some things that weren't always there to support specifically a product in the game, right? So we started building this core team within music with the ambition to be kind of a core pillar within Riot Games, or if you were to title it Riot Entertainment to an extent, right? And so what that required too is it's kind of like running a startup, right? Where, you know, you have the core company and since you're not you're not really always a part of the core product itself, which is video games. Um, you have to find ways to still help and drive value um, for the company, right? So we were definitely hitting kind of on these metrics of, you know, the brand, right? Like really enhancing the brand and also still finding ways to support car core products. So we had kind of this mid stage of trying to discover and figure out what could music really be almost on it, almost on its own. Um, but we still wanted to help and support thing other products across um, Riot Games, all right. So we also were helping esports itself, right. So with the opening ceremonies and the music that's involved in there, um, and this is when we really got into kind of music strategy overall for Riot, where it wasn't just hey let's let's do music that supports the whatever new product is coming out. It was how can we look across all products and how can music integrate into everything, both esports on you know, live events and production, as well as the broadcast itself that gets more into like sync um, and, and things like that. And so we were really just growing the music team with this ambition of like, what if it was not always connected to a core product? And we fell in this really cool spot in 2018 with KDA where, you know, you can kind of think of these teams at Ride is, you know, Ride Games was, you know, especially early on, very flat company, right? And highly empowered teams. So you had these individual teams. You you can think of it like, you know, uh, League of Legends, the MOBA game, right? You had esports over here, and you kind of had music that was growing over here as well. Um, and there's other teams, there's merch and, and whatnot, but each and every team was highly empowered. You know, to, you know, hey, esports, be the best esports, um, you know, team you can be, ha build esports to be the greatest esports if you can, right? And so these teams are highly empowered. Um, the con or the other side of the coin is all these teams had their own goals, 
right? So they were all driving to pursue their own goals. So when it came to working together, um, that's actually really tough because everybody has their own goals. It's like, how do you, you know, you have all these brothers and sisters, but they all have their own kind of goals and ambitions. So it's actually really hard to get them to work together um, to kind of create this concept of like, does one plus one equal one or can one plus one equal a bigger number if we actually collaborate together, right? Can we create something bigger at that moment? And so KDA was a really great, like for me, it was probably one of the biggest wins like behind the scenes because um, there was there's this campaign I had to go on really where where I was, you know, I had built this kind of concept around this band, but I was like, I think this this needs to work across all products. Like I want to debut this band at esports at our world finals, which is like our Super Bowl. Can they be the, the featured performers? Right. Um, and of course, we're going to do music and the album. And then we also want to integrate them into the game and have these great skins and things like that. And so, you know, I used to joke that you know, about a third of my deck was actually about that was the on the concept of like, how do we get teams together who have different goals? How do we kind of structure that? Um, and so that was one of the first times that we really did that well at Riot. And it was like, it was amazing. It was incredibly tough. Right. Or you the way I try to kind of give the idea is, you know, when teams have their own goals and their own built pipelines. Right. For example, you'll have a, a a creative director, but each team has its own creative director. So who's making the creative decision? Right. Like, hey, this should look a certain way. Who who actually is right? And, That's tough. Yeah. Yeah. And especially when let, let's just say in the game right so when you build assets for in a game like league of legends is this top down view so the assets technically are like really squished and fat because to be able to see the characters and play with them right so things like shoes you can't see the shoes right but on in our music videos the shoes are actually pretty important to us like oh that's going to tell a lot are they in heels how do they look um and so you have people who will have opinions based on which team they're on because it could affect our, you, you know, you may say like, ah, oh, we can't do that. Cause that's not going to look good on stage. Like, you know, when we put them on stage, it may look great in the game uh, or it may look great on stage, but nobody's going to see it in the video. Like nobody's going to see the earring in the video game. Right. Um, so but the, but the earring, the earring is very meaningful to the person that's trying to design it driven by another goal. That's, that's not necessarily a counter, but you know, maybe just a little far off. So one, yeah. one quick follow up on something you said earlier was, you know, is this idea of like, you have, you, if you think of like the adjacent teams, right. Uh, or the adjacency mm -hmm. is music, right. In this hierarchy. And it's almost like this, this web, this interconnected web that's you know connected with nodes and your team's doing something and then there's a, a structure like a brick and mortar structure behind it that's like traditional business right so what did you do like what are some of the things you and your team did specifically like one-on-one -on -one with the someone from the hierarchical traditional org to try and build that trust and and kind of get a win there and and then that kind of then that connectivity can excel a little bit right yeah no exactly i mean that's that was kind of like king of the process really right was building building those relationships uh across teams on on even figuring out how to make decisions so like you know when something would come up um and it was great had had a bunch of great teammates on this and who were willing to like hey we're having this issue and sometimes it's like you know a change was made here but you have to make sure that change is communicated across teams so they know to change it in their in their pipeline as well if needed you know, so we built kind of this process of kind of like, hey, here are some core decision makers from each team. Let's let's get together and let's raise kind of what are the current issues or what are updates? What are changes that are happening? Like, how can we keep ourselves in tune with what's going on with our individual teams um, so that everybody has awareness about that? Right. So it, it became king on like, hey, can we can we solve these problems together and can we do it in a, in a fashion that we get the context that is needed? to make the best or the most informed decision possible there. Right. So that became like really key is figuring out who those, who those kind of decision makers are to the extent. And then you also have to have, you know, that scenario of like, what if, what if we have a problem that there's no clear answer to who has the 51% in it or, you know, or mm. whatnot. And that, so that, that's still a thing too, is even though you build this kind of council on top to help, solve those problems you still almost need to have someone or a way of alleviating a tiebreaker right to an extent 
one one quick thing and, and mark sorry for coming during the conversation here feel free mm -hmm. to jump in whenever but uh I, another thing that jumped out what you said earlier uh change control and change management mm -hmm. very interesting analogy especially when working with a game development team right so whether you have a let's say it's a perforce server or whatever and you know i'm working on the lighting you're working on the character animation mark is working on the backgrounds we decide to instantiate a change that change has to filter through and the more you can automate that change uh the better so this is like the human version of like a perforce server or something right like mm -hmm. it's cool yeah and 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 to add to that complexity too right is you know different teams they have different kind of pipelines and needs and requirements at different times so for example you may for stuff in the game you may need to be you need you may need to make some decisions months ahead because once you make that decision it's hard to pull back pull that out it may be right versus um you know some changes can happen real quick on the music side potentially right so you also have to get an understanding of what decisions need to be made by a certain time so that all teams can adjust right and how can you make sure everyone's aware once a decision is made that it's nobody thinks it's like oh there's flex there because there may not be flex or if there is flex are you okay with um kind of a uh, inconsistency basically right like can there be some things that are inconsistent and be okay right in that so there's definitely a lot of complexity of just how flexible change can be whether it's from you know a production standpoint or just like creative direction and things like that like um it, there's a lot of complexity in these like interdisciplinary teams because it's quite different on like their timing and requirements to make something sometimes vastly different months and months different yep. and so, yeah. so people are sitting on challenges and problems for months sometimes mm -hmm. yeah like there, there were things or you know in, when working with the game team they're kind of like all right it takes us this long to make this you know with like the character so for example at that nine month point or whatever it is is like we're gonna you have to choose the characters and there's no way it can change because once we put that and start building that like there we won't have enough time to make a new character right for example so you got to really concept and land that well um and there's many other things that gets into smaller detail or you know you find out from another team oh because we're going to start making marketing assets at this point right um for this or you know the esports team that's working you know maybe an ar technology so you find out from the ar team that certain things is like hey we can't change the color of these like nope we can't do color of change like change of color there and so you're like oh okay right so that it just makes it really complex so it's a really interesting kind of phenomenon how many people were working on in this at the time like because Last year, I was working on a, on, a, on a much smaller game, but we had like three different teams in three different time zones, and there was about I don't know, like fifteen of us, not many. But even that, I was I was seeing and experiencing these massive changes in when deliverables were needed and who was going to do what once the avatar was ready, and the marketing team were going to do this, and the dev team had to take it and do this, and like, yeah, we had like fifteen people or something. How many people were? working on the music in the game at this time yeah it, it was almost hard to tell exactly because hundreds y y yeah definitely in the hundreds right because like the game team was definitely quite large and what it takes to make you know the assets and everything and then esports e and production was quite large as well working with a lot of contractors of course for like you know certain kind of live production things um, but like definitely in the hundreds in that so kind of production management and coordination became super key key in that and we had to build build that on the fly that was kind of like the, our motto was building the plane in the air <laughs> Build, building <laughs> complex systems we know well, we all know how complex planes are or complicated yeah. sorry don't complicated. Even that's yeah. right complicated yeah, yeah they not, don't they don't complex, have emergent complex. properties um, um <laughs> one of from so i was i was writing some game law and one of the things about storytelling and the influence of music is now influencing the storytelling where the game story and the law is being imagined and written with the music in mind with the the backstory of the characters in mind with like future concerts and future interoperability in online gaming festivals further down the line so the whole concept of creation of is is evolving because of the, this, this yeah. is incredible. 
It is. And, and, and the thing is, like, music and video games have actually had quite a great relationship for, you know, a very long time. I mean, you can look back, I mean, since the start of video games, but things that stand out to me, especially in my childhood, I mean, everything from obviously like the jingles and the sounds of certain games, and you're like, ah, oh, that's Zelda. That's when he opens up a chest, right? Yeah. Um, from audio cues and stuff. But even the things like when you get deeper into like, the, the partnerships of music and games, right? So there are things like, you know, was it, to me that stood out, like I remember SSX Tricky in particular and just like how involved the music was with that experience. Like that was a game you played and blasted the music. Um, and I even discovered some of my favorite artists at that time through SSX Tricky. You know, you had uh, Def Jam Vendetta, which really leaned into like, you know, the culture of hip hop and artists and stuff like that. Right. So there's this. Yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a snowboarder. And I've hurt myself because of FS, SX Tricky. Though, <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You can't quite do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, there's no controller for real life uh, snowboarding itself. Um, yeah. So it's, there's always been this relationship. And I think what it is is, and what's great about music too. Um, and this kind of leans into like the this, this overall convergence that's happening in the space, right? For me, it's just like it's not that it's the first time that they're converging. It's just these convert the convergence is becoming more integrated and deeper because new technology is is enabling new things to happen. And music has this really interesting way of being at the cusp of it. And what I mean by that is, within music, you'll always have an artist or artists that are willing to experiment and try things, right? You're going to have the grimes, you're going to have, right? As they're looking for new ways to kind of express themselves and music itself, like, oh, what can I be a part of? What's going on? You know, like, oh, I grew up with gaming, right? And I'm an, a music artist, right? Like, how, how do I pull these things together? And so it, that just makes for a lot of great, you know, the, the word synergy, as I hate to say, but like a lot of <laughs> synergy um, in a way for like, for them to kind of complement each other, whether it's like this music enhances the lore, right? It, I mean, you could see how maybe even a, someone like a Hans Zimmer could fit well with certain kind of high fantasy lore, things like that, right, in the game. Or if it's action packed and there's like EDM artists that you fit in, like you can find a type of or genre or more of like a thematic or aesthetic of a game. And then you can look at music and there'll be something that could probably fit. In fact, it will, it, not only will it fit, it will probably enhance it depending on how deeply you integrate it so to speak right and then now of course you have these you know in-game concerts or you know things like that because the tech is and entertainment and tech are really converting and i think it's really interesting where you you look at some of the more like the new and interesting things that are happening in entertainment like music right you had you know what we did at right games with you know esports and you know everybody from like with kda and imagine dragons that we did back in 2014 do you also have like what Travis Scott, Fortnite, right? And Marshmallow, like a lot of these really cool music experiences have happened and been a part of games, right? To an extent, right? Because I think, you know, video games is tech, right? And what it is, it's tech and entertainment. It's like, how do you, how do you make entertainment really fun using technology? Like that's what video games does really well. And so I think we're seeing more of that because we're, we're looking for more entertainment these days with new technology evolving, right? You have the Apple provision. So I, I expect to see something down the road down there that's going to combine music and that tech. And you're going to see something really cool, I think, in the very near future. So I think it's a really exciting time right now for all of this. And you're starting to see more and more of it. Really, really interesting point there that, you know, <clears throat> to me, everything kind of points back to as a centralized theme for a lot of things in the latest iteration of, you know, tech and experiences and that sort of thing is this is this expected evolution of artist and fan right and that and that relationship of like hey not only how do we make it more where the artists kind of control their own game and do more things not game but their own business and and maintain direct connections to their fans and super fans and that sort of thing but the interaction has to has to evolve it has to be like mark and i always talk about this this bi-directional value exchange that's that's mm -hmm. happening and games allow that interactivity right so i think that's why we're pointing to that and you're looking at yeah. like what unreal engine can do and and how that automates things that you know hey if if mark jumps up and down you know this kind of thing can be triggered and he could influence maybe what happens in the game so what what are you where are you pointing these days as we kind of wrap up the conversation like you know you come out of this you know great 
um, experience that the things that you built at Riot, not only just the teams, but the projects and the products and the pilots and all of that. Where are you taking that knowledge and, and, and where are you pointing it uh, over the next couple of years? Yeah. So I've just kind of had this thesis, right, uh, for me where, you know, I, I learned a lot at, at Riot. I had a great experience. And what I was able to do is really focus on League of Legends players as the audience, right? And, and the question I started asking myself is, how can I enhance their experience? How can I make it more fun or more enjoyable, right? And especially for mu like music fans within League of Legends, right? So there were people that were really connecting to music. How can I enhance that? So KDA, for example, was that, you know, how do you build a super fan so that you could, or super band, excuse me, so that you can build this incredible experience around the band for players. Um, and so what I really learned there was there's this ability to look at audiences um, with with this new technology and kind of new forms of entertainment. And it's like, how, how can you just make it more fun? How can you make this more fun for the audience? And now what I've been really excited about is you can look, you know, for, as an example, you look at whether it's the music industry and, and looking at music fans, you know, like I kind of asked myself, is it more fun to be a music fan now than it was you know, 20, 30 years ago? Has it, has it really changed, right? Because when you look at, being a, a a gamer like it's amazing to be a gamer now because there's more games incredible games and video games have to innovate you know people don't want to play the same video game twice or you know over and over so new games have to bring something new and fresh so i'd argue that it's it's actually more fun to be a you know a gamer now because there's just all these incredible games and they've really just kind of evolved so you can look at other audiences with that same lens and you know you have all this emerging new technology that's coming out i think a lot of these you know domains don't quite know what they look like in the next you know even three to five years right with kind of all the evolution that's happening they're all looking for the next product or the next platform so what really excites me is kind of that being the opportunity space of all right you know how can you weave in telling great stories delivering entertainment with new technology um, that's more accessible you know, there's also the creator economy that's kind of built this additional layer that didn't really exist as much before. At least it's easier for people to participate in that way. So I think all of this, again, I just call it the convergence. It's the convergence of at a very high level, it's entertainment and technology. Right. And so whether it's music, film or game on the entertainment side or if it's the different types of technology that we have access to or that's coming out, whether it's, you know, even things like AI or just like all all this new technology that's building ways for creators to kind of express themselves or deliver connection to their fans right all of this is like evolving and kind of ready to create new and so i'm excited like about jumping in that pool and and finding teams and you know helping other teams and people who kind of believe in that future set where it's going to be it's just going to be an entertainment going to evolve and it's going to be more fun in many different ways so who's going to build those products Who's going to build those platforms? Those are the people I really want to help. And I also think as kind of a last note is I think it, it's not that it's I think video games is going to be core to that future state. And I don't it's not that I'm saying everything's going to be a video game. But when you look at a lot of the talent that comes from like people who have created these cross marketing kind of campaigns or these really integrated um, campaigns and experiences and products using technology and entertainment in video games. I think these people are coming from video games and they're going to help advance kind of entertainment, in different sectors because of that experience. So th those are the things that I'm excited about. If that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, I think that, and you're probably right. And um, I've got one observation what, and one question. Um, the observation, just something I was thinking about coming into this was, Kind of, I, I was listening to Edward Norton the other day. He was speaking on a podcast about the f making movies, and he was talking about being in the production room and having they filmed all the scenes and it's and they're going through it and they're just they're watching the dry film and there's something missing and it, like and it's like you just watch the film without the music and it's just it's not complete and not only is it not complete it's 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 missing its soul almost mm -hmm. and when as soon as you put the music in then then the film makes sense then mm -hmm. the film resonates then the film tells the story and incites the emotions that it was written to incite and last week our guest was talking about this 
communal experience that we're missing and everyone's becoming very individualistic and individual experiences and i was thinking about the personalization of music in video games and how important the music is to the story and whether all of this technology is going to actually make that more powerful or is it going to are, are there downsides are there potential downsides to having this kind of um yeah hyper personalization which I, I know that's not exactly what we've been talking about but like if you had an opinion on that at all yeah um i, I was gonna say um like yeah so i think with evolution it's kind of it also means change right so i think you get both sides you get some things that you know we hold on to and love the way they were, right? It's like, oh, I don't want this to change. And when that change, it tugs at your heart, right? Um, to an extent, because like, oh, and I'm kind of becoming that old man <laughs> to an extent in ways, <laughs> right? But for those new audience, the, you know, who didn't experience as much and they're not so anchored in that, right? They're more a part of the positive part where it's like, oh, this this is also unlocking new ways and, and things like that. And I, I think that's really what this evolution is starting to bring is like, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there are pros and cons. There are some things that are going to kind of die and go away, but there are new things that are going to come and be an enhanced to an extent. Right. And so I, I think it's, you know, I could do a whole, <laughs> probably a whole episode specifically on, I guess what I call the power of music. And it's the way I look at music is it has different levers of what it can do, right? Like it can, it can drive emotion, right. And storytelling, for example, like, like to your, your examples, you know, if you've watched like a horror movie, but if you take the music out, it's really corny, right? Something pops yeah. out at you and it's like, boo. <laughs> and you're like, have you, have you, see, have you seen that one? Not to, sorry to jump on you, but I, I think there, the, the shining, there's like a, there's a, there's a video where the shining has, instead of the creepy music, it's Salisbury Hill, Peter Gabriel. And like in these gnarly scenes, the movie. it's like, wait a minute, this is kind of happy, but really weird. Um, mm -hmm. That's a, that's a great reference. And then there's a scene in Goodfellas somewhere on the video where Henry Hill, the, one of the main characters, is like walking his wife through the bow or before she was a wife, the bowels of this like uh, restaurant. And he's giving people twenty dollar bills and shaking hands and all that. And you hear it without music; it's got no vibe. But then there's this like big time, like big bandy music, and it's like, oh man, this thing is rad. Like, so those are two that I always point out to to mm -hmm. illustrate the power of music. Yeah, yeah, great, that's, yeah, great reference. Yeah, those great examples. I've seen ones where. It, it, they probably changed like they used like five different takes of totally different music and it just changed the meaning of what was happening right because it there's you know music can also bring context basically as it is too right so it can drive emotion it can build context it can it can bring kind of the 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 i guess if you want to call it like the gravitas and like um awareness around it like the celebrity like you can work with a big artist and big name and that'll get people excited about it. like music can come and help and do many different things right so that's actually what i tend to look at the opportunity with like well what are we really trying to accomplish are we trying to drive emotion do we want people to feel a certain way and then all right let's lean into music in that way and really design it to do that um or it can just build hype right if you want to do that so there's there's a lot of really cool mechanics of music and the way i look at it is again coming from video games maybe you've seen where you know you have this character and you're trying to they have like certain attributes and it's like this little pentagon or something so if they're really strong and something like it shows really strong across you get this funny shape that's like their character profile of their strengths and weaknesses like i view music like that is it has these different attributes and you can actually design your music character for for your project or game or whatever depending on what you want music to mean for it there there's a beautiful book um out there by uh victor wooten one of the most innovative bass players of all time and it's called the music lesson and whenever i work with brands um to help them kind of establish their music center of excellence is what we call it kind of this little pilots to products kind of incubator right i always have them read that book because it takes um complex things that like harmony and melody and timbre and all of those and treats them it's like a it's like mr miyagi meeting ralph macchio and like teaching him all of these things in narrative form mm -hmm. so That's any brands right. who want to learn that should definitely read the music lesson um i know we're I, or, or call you or, yep. or, call, or call me and toa and we could help you figure <laughs> there you it go. out yeah that, that'd be even more fun <laughs> since since we're riffing on this like um, one of the things I, I i read about you before when you were 
growing up in Alaska, you 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 played sax and you and you studied jazz. Mm-hmm. And I know you've spoken about we spoke about heavy metal earlier, and before the show you spoke about you were a DJ as well. So interdisciplinary music. Mm-hmm. Um, what did what did jazz? What did playing jazz bring to 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 how you how you think about music and how you think about this interdisciplinary nature of the teams you're building? Does it? Yeah. Yeah. With jazz, my kind of interaction with with jazz, and so this was like this was junior high, early junior high when I fell in love with jazz. Like, so I was playing the saxophone, and this this will date me, and and I don't know how proud I want to say this yet, or maybe it's good, right? So, um, <laughs> I, I was I kind of fell into jazz because. I thought Kenny G was pretty cool back then uh, on the soprano sax. And I was like, I think I want to play soprano. And um, my jazz teacher at the time was like, well, let's start you off with alto sax first. So I started there. But jazz, what it did for me was kind of it opened the door of like, I really fell in love with, you know, improvisation, right? Having the ability to improvise and express. And it was just such a thrill at an early age to like really be, to have that be a part of almost like my daily ritual of, of music. And I had a phenomenal uh, music teacher at that time um, who would have us kind of come in one day and say, hand us a clarinet and say like, I know you don't know how to play it, but you're gonna improvise something on it. You're gonna pick up a few notes and you're gonna improvise. And just that, like having that improvisation aspect. And, and in fact, right, like that was just so exciting to me to like, improvise and just create like that was I think when I first really started to feel like I was creating things and enjoying it and when I got into DJing after that um I wasn't your typical like mixing music DJ I was a I was a turntablist actually so a scratch DJ because to me it was using the turntable like an instrument and it was just it was just jazz to me so when I was first in college people were coming up to my dorm room like, oh, you're a DJ. Like you should, let's, let's kind of have a party and play music. And I was like, I have no party records. I was like, I may, I may, I make weird scratches and noises and I kind of play with beats and juggle and I do kind of more trick DJ. So I was more of a performance DJ. Um, and that's what I was doing with kind of live performance and working with lab, rec, uh, you know, independent record labels and like doing shows and performances. Like I was a battle DJ. Like that's what DJing was at first for me. <laughs> Okay. That's so one quick thing to tie that all into this whole episode <laughs> that we're talking about, you know, with with stacking these teams that are operating in in the murky, messy mm-hmm. middle of innovation, right? So jazz, and this is a nod to Vic Wooten's book. He would he would say, and he said this in videos as well. Like whenever you play music, you're always a half step away from the right solution, right? <laughs> Just in the way the music notes work, right? In in Western music, whatever. But, um. Jazz gives you the ability to to try something and make mistakes. And I think that humanity is so averse to that. They're so worried Mm -hmm. about just in general, oh, if I say this or if I try that, this guy's going to think less of me or I'm not going to be able to get my next promotion. Jazz gives you the early jazz. Mm -hmm. There's very intricate uh, infrastructures within like high level jazz, but I'm just talking about improvisation. And Mm -hmm. I think that everybody should find a way to improvise. Um, not even musically, but just find a way to improvise. Because I think it lowers the barrier, it mm-hmm. increases creativity, and it, it allows you to connect without feeling like you're going to get beat up for doing something wrong. Yeah, I, I think that aligns with just overall like not not fearing to fail, right? Like it's like you just try it out. You know, you can always adjust, and you become better for doing that, right? And so I think that there is some alignment in that. Yeah. Wonderful skills, yeah. Wonderful. Well, this this is a great conversation. I, I when we first talked to I, I I knew we would get to something like this, and I'm so glad you spent some time and energy uh, with us today. We will have if you're not joining live, we will have this uh, up on Spotify and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also on our YouTube channel. Um, a quick shout out again to the wonderful folks at Ripple W R I P P L E. Speaking of stacking interdisciplinary teams and coordinating um, help on large projects, those guys are wonderful. Over three thousand vetted solopreneurs of various disciplines that they could uh pull together a team to work on whatever you need so thanks to those guys um mark last quick shout out about the book club before we before we get out of here if you like books if you like reading books join the thinking on paper book club it's that simple thinking on paper dot xyz to to learn more and if you don't like reading books you can just listen. If you don't to the like episodes. reading books, you're not you're not listening to this. Thinking on paper, are you? You could you could listen to the episodes of us talk about the books, 
or if you do read a book, you could be in one of these squares over here and unpack it in real time. But anyway, that's uh, that's it for today. Thinking on paper X, Y, Z is where you can find us. We'll have a whole bunch of information about Toa and where you can find him and connect to him. Um, that's all I have, Mark. Any closing thoughts on your side? Stay disruptive. Stay curious. And keep, keep thinking, thinking on, on paper. paper.